is going on, guys? It is Brian Jack with Simple Men's Comics, and we are back with another special episode of that Simple Man's Comics and Friends podcast. This is our flagship podcast. The audio version is available on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, pretty much wherever audio podcasts are found. So make sure you subscribe to that there. But this is a great episode. We have two comic book retailers. We have one, which is our channel sponsor, Frankie's Comics, Kevin Fields himself. And we also have a newcomer, Patreon member, just getting out into that retailer game. And that is John Leone from the 616comics.com. Yes, Jack, sir. I'm excited. You excited? Oh, absolutely. You know, we've talked a lot on the channel about retailer exclusive variants. And it's a topic that sometimes people have tried to avoid, but we like to delve into it. And how better to do that than to bring on two people who are involved heavily in the production and resale of retailer exclusive variants albeit at two different stages of the game one as you mentioned brian just entering and one a veteran of course in kevin fields and frankie's comics so we're going to talk about variant production we're going to talk about selecting artists and what goes into it and all the topics that you guys want to know in the simple men's comics youtube family yeah unless you're living under a rock everyone knows frankie's comics and the super Badass exclusive variants they do. I know our Patreon members, know, especially those that are subscribed to that <laughs> Bolo box, because they get two in that Bolo box every month. But also, we just released an ebook, right, Jack? We did. We did 100 back issues to add to your collection. It features all of those great top 10 back issue show lists that we told you we were compiling for something special, over 130 pages. Not only does it have all of these great books with imaging and variant covers, but it also includes anecdotes from both Brian and I talking about market trends, talking about things to kind of be on the lookout for and things to avoid when adding to your collection or your investment portfolio. That is available right now at simplemanscomics.com for the low price of $1.95. So make sure you guys check that out. And with that being said, we're going to put the topics for tonight's show up on the screen right now and get into it. So we know Kevin Fields from Frankie's Comics. We know John from 616. Both of them are into retail. Both do exclusive variants. Part of that is distribution, getting those books in hand. We want to know, what are your thoughts on the current distribution of comic books? And do you think it's okay for Midtown and DCBS to distribute comics, even though they are retailers themselves? And do you think they'll truly be able to compete with Diamond? Kevin, we'll start with you. Sure. Uh, thanks for having me on. Um, so I think it's okay for Midtown and DCBS to, to participate in distribution of comics. They have a pretty large, uh, they have large facilities and a good supply chain to get comics to retailers. Um, Midtown has been distributing stuff for um, one of the large publishers for a while. People just didn't realize that, um, trade paperbacks and stuff. So it kind of makes sense that they would take this next step. I think, uh, I think competition in the marketplace is always good. Um, so, and this gives retailers choice a choice also, um, even down to the packing, uh, from what I'm hearing, uh, the DCBS folks are using bubble wrap around their comics, um, whereas sometimes Diamond does that, sometimes they don't. Um, so I, I'm, I'm all for it. Um, will they be able to compete? They need to get, uh, they need to get Marvel. Um, so they, they need to get more publishers in order to make it viable so that the cust uh, comic book stores could choose which distributor they want to go to. Um, and they need to work on their shipping costs. Diamond has really aggressive shipping prices because they're able to negotiate with UPS. Um, so these uh, Midtown and DCBS are going to have to come down on their shipping costs in order to be competitive with Diamond. What about you, Joan? I know you're getting into it, but I'm sure this all weighs in your mind. Absolutely. Um, yeah, thanks for having me, Brian and Jack. Uh, it's great to be on the show. Uh, it's great to be on with uh, the legend, Kevin Fields. Uh, look up to Kevin. Love, <laughs> actually love Frankie's comics. So just thrilled thanks. to be with you guys. Um, yeah, everything that Kevin said, um, I, I do have a little bit of, um, it's not even really a concern. I mean, everybody knows, um, you know, that these guys are also 
Uh, retailers, I do think there needs to be a, a very clean bifurcation between, um, you know, like the distribution and the retail end. And maybe that's being worked out behind the scenes. Uh, and I'm not aware of that. But I do think there, there can be, you know, from an ethical perspective, maybe a little bit of a conflict, uh, not passing judgment on anybody in those companies. I know everybody's trying to do the best job possible. Uh, it's a really weird time right now. Uh, it's hard to know where exactly to step in the market. I love the competition. I think that's going to uh, improve everybody's game and everybody's service. Uh, so I'm, I'm definitely down for that, but it is difficult to, uh, to navigate a market that's so uncertain. So I think that's the main concern right now. That's the biggest concern uh, to me is, you know, uh, the, these guys, they have to get Marvel. And I think Image uh, and, and Boom and some of the other, uh, you know, indie and small publishers will follow suit thereafter, but it's really hard to commit, um, you know, to, to Lunar or UCS when they only have the one line of comics. Yeah, you're essentially talking about a DC Comics distribution system right now. I think that's really the best point um, is whenever I hear this topic talked about, it seems like we're hearing it from the perspective of the shipping, which we all know, uh, you know, Diamond's historic shipping issues that, you know, retailers have voice their concerns over the years at various conventions and summits, but the the issue of exclusive agreements for distribution, I think, with publishers is really going to be the, the key element to whether or not this truly turns into a kind of multi-distributor -distribu system, but it's interesting to hear from you guys being retailers who have to make those decisions. It's real easy for Brian and I. We talk about this, and there's a lot of other talking heads on YouTube who get on here and share our opinion. But you guys, this directly affects your bottom line. These are decisions that you guys have to make. So that's why this show is so great, because we get to have that kind of perspective brought in. Yeah, I want to second one, what Jack said about we always have our own opinion, but we're from the outside looking in, so we don't know all the nuances. That's why it's such a great thing to have channel sponsor Kevin Fields on here to talk firsthand his experience and, 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 and spread that knowledge of lessons learned and what he knows onto our viewers, who I'm sure have a lot of these same questions, because we're always of that mindset. It was like, hey, how do retailers really feel when other retailers are now the ones distributing books? But Come to find out, a lot of people seem to be okay with it. Yeah, and now, speaking of being able to go directly to the source, something that we've talked about is how the, the pandemic and the shutdown of comics has really impacted uh, so many different parts of our industry. And being that you guys are both in the business of developing exclusive variants, and the fact that Brian and I have been involved in a couple of such projects in the past, I know how long these kind of like project schedules can take before you get these accomplished. Did the shutdown and distribution have a, a great impact on your production schedule and how were you able to adjust? So, you know, a lot of the, a few of the projects I had in the pipeline got pushed back, uh, specifically uh, Venom 25, um and batman adventures one just as an example um so those were delayed so you, you get a lot of customers emailing asking um where the books are what's going on because believe it or not there's a lot of comic book folks that don't uh, participate in social media so they're not getting the constant up to the minute uh information um so it, it that happened the pushback of the of the releases we also had a, a, a couple of projects that got canceled. Um, so we, we were gonna, we were gonna do, I think a Gwen Stacy cover for Gwen Stacy. And I believe that's now going digital. So I think my cover got canceled um, with Marvel, unfortunately. And then um, one of the artists that we were gonna use for Venom 26, he, he, you know, he got, he got busy with some other projects. So then he, he couldn't do the project because there was a delay. So it definitely affected us. Um, I mean, every day I'm getting emails asking where Venom 25 is, where Batman 92 is. I don't have a cover for Batman 92, but Batman Adventures 1. <laughs> so it, it's definitely impacted us. Um, and then some of the publishers furloughed their employees. So, you know, the communication kind of stopped, you know, and it's like, oh, is this person, did he get laid off? Did he get fired? You know, like I was in the middle of a project and here we are, I, I can't get in touch with this person. 
Um, so, or did they get sick? You know, that's the other thing. Did, did, did they get sick? So it definitely had a, a significant impact. It was kind of like everything just got frozen. And, um, you know, it was, it was a little frustrating because you want to get moving, you want to get going, you want to get the stuff done. So it was definitely impacting on my business. Now, John, you're in this unique position where you've started reselling. You're very active doing that. And now you're starting the process of developing your own retailer exclusive program. How did this impact you in that, you know, you kind of couldn't get off the ground when you wanted to? Yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a really interesting uh, time period. So um, we're a, a small, you know, family owned business and my wife is my partner. Uh, it's interesting and exciting. My son actually starts with his part time tomorrow. He's been off the books. We're going to bring him on the books officially tomorrow. So really excited about that. But we really use this time to uh, because we're in like, you know, the embryonic stage with, with our business. Um, but I feel like that we've emerged um, a lot stronger. I use the time to really reach out to a lot of creators and I tried to establish some relationships uh, and discussions with some artists so that we could come out of the other side here. Uh, strong and full throttle and um you guys know from some discussions that we've had uh off camera that uh yeah full throttle so we kind of use the time of uncertainty uh as a, as an opportunity um you know to to move into a space where like i already talked about before like there's a lot of uncertainty the uncertainty is kind of rampant out there um but we felt really confident in our position we've made some really smart financial uh, decisions recently with uh, with our business and we also have another business as well uh, that enabled us to to really come out stronger we're very thankful uh, for, for that opportunity to do that um, but we used it as an opportunity to, to reach out to creators and try to establish some relationships uh, and even on the business side we were able to establish some phenomenal relationships uh, on the business side during this downtime uh, we felt that it's just, it's been a lot easier for us to get in touch with people that we feel like maybe before, um, during the normal grind of the day to day, um, might not get back to us, you know, but I feel like there was a little bit of a vacuum and we were able to step in and, uh, uh get really aggressive, uh, with our plans moving forward. So we're, we're excited, you know, comics are back, man. This is an exciting time. Super thrilled, super thrilled. I also want to bring up, I know Kevin mentioned how he keeps being contacted because not only did it affect him, but it affected the customers that might have ordered some books and it, and it, and it slipped the, the schedule a little bit. And he brought that up while he gets contacted every day. So um, that's one thing that you definitely have to take into consideration if you're going to be doing this as, as a business like Kevin and John, John are doing is um, yeah, you have to have some good customer service skills, I'm pretty sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yes, for sure. Yes, e quick responses is really important to customers. Yes, I spend a lot of time on customer service. Yeah. And then I know we, we put some of Frankie's and now we're starting to put some of, some of John's uh, variants or the variants he obtains into the bolo boxes for our Patreon members. And a lot of the feedback that we get from those is uh, how great the covers are, how great the cover art is, how great the artist is that did it, um, with that being said, can you explain the process that goes into consideration? One, when picking the artist or what book you're going to pick it for, is the artist like your personal favorite or do you also think, consider, hey, this artist is actually more marketable. This is, I think more people will want this. It might not be my favorite, but kind of give us and the viewers what goes into your process when you're picking artists and books to make these exclusives. Kevin, we'll start with you again. Okay, sure. Um, well, the first thing that we do is we get the previews catalog when it's when it comes out, and we start looking at the titles. So, we you know we start with the titles to see what titles are going to be of interest. Um, that's the first part of it for us, um, and then from there, based on the content or the particulars of the cover, then we try to decide which artist is going to be a good fit uh, for that. So. Um, so that's what we typically do. And then there are other factors that will we'll weigh into it as well, like ratio variants and stuff like that. Um, then you kind of you kind of start looking about what's trending on social media, what artists are trending on social media. Obviously, right now, it's, it's a peach craze. So she's at the top of our list, typically. Um, and then every, you know, we 
I try to try to see, figure out what my customers are going to want before I put my taste in front of the project. Now, sometimes it's hard because so there's sometimes where I'll just do a project just because I, I like the artist or I, I like the cover. And the other stores that I work with, they'll just bail on me because they're like, oh, no, we're not going to make any money. <laughs> so, so sometimes you just got to do that, you know, if, if it's something you really believe in. Um, and, you know, we also want to try to use a diverse set of, of artists that are so – we want to try to have some balance in the, the number of covers an artist is doing for us. So I, I love Peach's art, but, like, I don't want – every cover of mine to be a peach cover you know we, we want to mix it up and we want to bring different styles in so that the customers are interested in in us there are some stores who who will tend to just use the same artist over and over again and and, and I, I don't really like that it's not very exciting um in my opinion so we we try to mix it up as best we can um and we try to stay loyal to the artists that we've been using you know if if the artist hits a rough patch or something we you know, or the sales dip, we, we want to try to stick with those folks because they, you know, they were with us before. Um, so, yeah, and definitely the artist has to be marketable. So if, for example, if an artist is doing stuff on social media that's not appropriate, that's it's over. <laughs> I can't, you know, I don't, I don't have time to deal with, with that and customer service and everything else I'm doing. So they've, you know, they've got to be good citizens as best we can now, now that now that being said you know I'm, I'm tolerant everybody makes mistakes here and there but you know there's just some things that we just we're done like i just can't deal with it so but um yeah so i would say we start with the the title to see what the book is see who the what interest is from the customers and when the previous catalog comes out you can kind of tell on facebook like oh there's this new book coming you know like people start talking about it so that's a, a big indicator right there um so if you do a project on a cover on a title that's not of interest to people you're really it's going to be really hard to make money just to start so that's that's one thing um so i think i kind of rambled on there sorry <laughs> no, no that was good that's kind of what we were looking for especially since you've been in the game for so i mean i remember when we were back in Google Plus days and first finding out about oh, yeah. it and just everything that's grown on since yep. then, it's like you've definitely honed the craft, if if you could say. But um, oh, I still have a lot to learn. I still, still, <laughs> I still have a lot to learn. So, and John, I, I mean, how you know, um, you're kind of right now. We mentioned you're getting into your own, but you're also kind of I don't want to say co-op is the right word, but you're you know you are in negotiations or you're talking in a, in a group of people, how does that kind of fit into there with how covers are being selected and, and stuff like that? Well, I, uh, I operate, um, first of all, I agree with everything that Kevin just said. Um, that's the type of strategy that I like to uh, employ. The very first thing for me, rather than the title, um, is the artist. So I have certain artists that I uh, feel a certain way about, right? For me, if comics is, uh, is, is all, it's all about the, the visceral joy and excitement of, of comic books. So I'm thrilled to, um, to just be able to talk to some of these people. If they can wow me, right? If that wow factor hits, that's what I'm looking for. And, and it's different styles, right? It can be different styles of comics, uh, different styles of art. But if it, if it hits me and I feel a certain way about it, um, I put that artist on, on you know, my list, so to speak. And, and then the project has to fit the artist, uh, like Kevin said also. So um, there's, there's certain artists that you, you, you guys know it. When you see a cover or when you see a piece of art, you're like, whoa, wow, look, who did that? Sometimes you can tell immediately who did that. Sometimes you can't. Um, but for me, it's about the artist first. Um, and then, and then the book and then the book second. So, uh, I, I, I differ a little bit with, uh, as far as process, uh, not that one's right or one's wrong. I'm just, uh, you know, a, a, an emotional Italian guy that, that operates mainly on heart, right. Coming out of the gate. So, um, it's interesting. Like I, I haven't, uh, spearheaded any of the projects, um, you know, that I've been in, involved with, um, I've given some input and feedback here and there, but uh, we do have a lot that, that's coming down the pike. 
Um, so I'm hoping you're going to be seeing a lot from us pretty soon. Um, but so far I've been, um, you know, mouth shut, ears open. Like I am right now listening to Kevin. Mouth shut, ears open. So Kevin, you had mentioned also about there's some picks that you like to pick and then other people might not like it. Recently, right. you just had that IDW Star Wars Adventures Clone Wars number one Peach Momoko variant that kind of took off like fire. It's heating up on the secondary market right now. Was that one of those picks that you had your hands all over? I, I heard that that was one of your choices for yeah. that cover specific. It was, it was. So we we struggled with Star Wars titles in the past. Uh, whenever I want to do a Star Wars book, my wife just wants to hit me. Um, so <laughs> they they can be they can be challenging. Uh, to sell. Um, but I really like Peach's art and IDW has a reasonable minimum number of copies you have to order. So I went for it. Um, we tried to, do, to get Ahsoka on the cover, but um, Lucasfilm said no. So I suspect they're holding her off because they're going to do a comic book series with her. They don't want me running around with the cover <laughs> before, they, before they do that. But so they gave me kind of a few uh, limited number of choices uh, for the book. And so we chose Yoda. Um, and I was nervous because, you know, not everybody wants a little green guy on their cover. And, um, you know, it, it is the guy who, who buys from me who likes Venom, uh, Clayton Crane Venom cover, going to want to buy a Peach uh, Yoda cover. So I was nervous. Um, and then we shared the art kind of on social media and, it got a really good reception. So we just, we went for it. Um, I was actually going to bundle the Yoda cover together with Peach's Ray cover and sell them as a package for a really low price. <laughs> and when we saw the, the response on social media, my wife said, let's not do that. Just, just, you know, trust your instincts. And so we put it up for sale. And I mean, my, my allocation of the book sold out pretty quickly. Um, so, it, it went really well. I'm really thankful for it. But that was definitely one where I just, I went with my gut on it and I was willing to just, you know, not sell a single copy. <laughs> um, so yeah, definitely. That was one. So I'm glad that worked out. We're very fortunate and Peach did a great job on the cover. Well, I think that's an amazing anecdote there, Kevin, is you kind of get to, to look behind the decision making that goes into making one of these variants you know they don't just happen like the, the, the books don't just put themselves on hot lists as people like to say <laughs> you know people have to create these exclusive variants and you went through the process of how you did that you talked about i like how you mentioned the consternation you had where you weren't sure if this was going to work but boy did it you're talking about a book that you released for 20 dollars, selling on the secondary market now more than four times what it originally went wow. for i mean just <laughs> staggering secondary market prices and you know this is actually something kevin that's bothered me uh probably all weekend really kind of ruined my weekend okay. was i have to congratulate you i did it on on instagram i'm gonna do it publicly right here on the channel okay. but uh an absolute achievement for somebody who creates a retailer exclusive variant is for it to penetrate the secondary market very few of them do mostly we know they're marketed as collectibles for the like you mentioned people who feel a certain way about a character or an artist um but this book did this book was one of the most talked about books over the last week and it was so talked about that the various publications that cover the secondary market and the hot lists um Put it on the list, which is, is unique for a retailer exclusive variant. And it's another reason why we wanted to have this episode right here because we, as we mentioned, there's, for whatever reason, sometimes gets to be a negative connotation surrounding retailer exclusive variants. And people, uh, they don't always want to give credit or their roses, as the young kids would say, to the to people who, who deserve them. So I noticed uh, that you made the comicbookinvest.com CBSI Hot 10 list. You made the Key Collector Top 20 um, list. And then you also made Comic Tom's shortened down version of the top 10 from Key Collector. But I also noticed that not a single one of these sources quoted Frankie's comics as the creator of the book. No one even referenced you. Now, I don't know whether or why that is because CBSI or Comic Tom couldn't say have an issue with retailer exclusive variants because both of them produce retailer exclusive variants. Uh, 
So, so they couldn't. They, yeah, they they can't they can't really take a moral high ground there. Uh, Comic Tom actually used the segment to promote his upcoming Peach from Oko variant. Um, but so neither of them um, can take that moral high ground. Uh, and if you're arguing that you're trying to like give people the information. Well, you know, you let pe- let your community know where this book was because, as you mentioned, you have a Ray variant coming right behind it, and no, yeah. no one went and did their research and found out anything about the Facebook group that was alerted about yeah. that, how this how this book even kind of came to be. So that sort of disappointed me because I felt, as you know, you being such a, a loyal supporter of our channel, I felt like you got slighted there. I would love to know how you felt about that. Well, I, I was disappointed, uh, and particularly on the Yoda cover, because it was my idea. I mean, it, it really was, from start to finish. Um, you know, it was a, it's a kid's comic book, basically, right? So that right there, that, that makes it a little bit harder to sell. So I, I was hoping they would just mention our store name next to it. And I reached out to one of the guys, and he said that he didn't want to be accused of promoting store variants or, or pumping and dumping, I think was the term he used. Um, and so that's why he, he didn't give us the, the credit. Um, so I, I think that they should, I really do. Cause you know, some of these guys will have store variants on the list. I think it only makes sense. If you're going to mention the publisher, the writer and the artist, why not the store who commissioned the cover? Um, so yeah, you know, it, it got to be the point where I actually reached out to, to one of the guys. Oh, that, and that response, um, so, that yeah. response, that response, Kevin, I got to tell you, is kind of bullshit because again, as we said, they, you know, they've produced variants. And then even furthermore, um, if a variant reached the hot 10 from say one of their sponsors, I absolutely know they would have made sure to mention that sponsor name. And that was a shared variant with golden apple. Wasn't it? Who is a sponsor of that website? Yeah. Yes. Um, and I, I think, no, I didn't go back and look. But I think they have mentioned the stores in the past. They all, oh, you know, if we go back and look, they absolutely. Okay, they absolutely. <laughs> so, yes. I, you know, I, I don't know if it's just me, Frankie's Comics. They don't want to mention me, but I, yeah. So I, I don't know. I mean, but I guess people can find the cover because they can just go to eBay and do Peach Yoda, and it'll come up. But, but yeah, it, and it was a shared cover with Golden Apple Comics in California. They I, they typically work with us on like probably ninety nine percent of the covers we do. Um, but yeah, I, so I think they should, I, I really do. If they're going to do the artist, the writer, the, the publisher, the title of the book, they should at least mention the store who produced it because we took the risk, you know, we paid for this. We took all the risk. I mean, I feel like we should get some credit for it. Mm. <laughs> Something. So even if it's just like my initials at the end of it, <laughs> KF, or, I mean, that'd be nice. So, so yeah, I, I I'm just glad your name's not Frank really Underwood did. then. <laughs> well, and the other thing I'll say is like when they've, when some of these guys have written articles, you know, about other things in the comic book industry, they're not afraid to mention the store store's name in. <laughs> right. So, but I, it is what it is. I'm glad that it made the list and it brought attention and it and it's bringing more attention to Peach. Um, and secondly, I think I could be wrong, but I think it's bringing more attention to the Star Wars comic books. Yeah. Because I, I just go on a little tangent here, if that's okay, if I, if I take a moment. Um, a lot of the stuff that you see in the movies where there's like plot holes, or you're like, "Whoa, where did that come from?" Like that. Just a lot of that stuff gets filled in in these comic books. And so the IDW comics and the Marvel cover comics are, are canon now. And um, a lot of the stuff that Dark Horse did is no longer canon. So I think that if you're a Star Wars fan, you should really check out the comics and the trade paperbacks and stuff because they're going to fill in a lot of the stuff that the movies don't have time to fill in. Um, and the hints that I'm getting from from the publishers is that the Mandalorian season two and some of the other star Wars TV shows on Disney plus are going to heavily tie into the comics that are coming out. Um, which is why maybe they won't let me put a silk potato on the cover or they won't let me put Mandalorian or Boba Fett or Jango Fett. So, um, so 
So people should pay attention if they're Star Wars fans, you know, and everybody likes Star Wars. If they're Star Wars fans, they should be buying these comics. Not They don't have to buy the store variant, but they can just buy the regular cover and read it because there's some good stuff in there that that's kind of hinting at where things are going in the Star Wars universe in the future. There you go. That's some great jewels. A little bit of a, a gem of information there from Kevin Fields from Frankie's Comics. And this is a guy who knows because he's got his hands in the market like very few <laughs> others do. Now, we talked a little bit about Peach Romoko, and I want to bring both of you guys into this conversation because right now, Peach Romoko is definitely the number one artist in the game, kind of unquestionable. But this seems to be an ever changing position. So, with an eye to the future, who do you two see as that next big cover artist? And John, we'll start with you. Yeah, uh, Jack, it's, it's, it's hard to tell, right? Um, it's kind of like trying to pick, you know, what, what football team is going to win the Super Bowl. Um, Redskins. Starts. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. Uh, it, it's Redskins. a difficult question, right? Um, Ron Rivera. <laughs> yeah. So I can only go off of, you know, uh, like I said earlier, like how I feel, uh, 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 how I think my own personal taste. Um, I love that in comics we have such a wide variety, right, of art to choose from, going back on what Kevin was talking about earlier, where you want to have balance uh, in, in comics, just like in The Force, you want to have uh, balance. Um, I really like uh, a British artist named Hal Laren, uh, L-A-R-E-N, uh, phenomenal. Uh, I love Ryan Brown. Comics Elite uses Ryan Brown a lot. Um, he, he's already, you know, inching toward the top tier, if not in the top tier. I love a lot of Ryan stuff. And uh, I'm going to butcher the name. I think it's Korean, Young Yun Yoon, Y-O-O-N. Uh, I love a lot of Yoon's uh, stuff. He's got some really uh, amazing uh, flash cover bees. Uh, he had that Spider Woman, number one. Uh, so I love a lot of his stuff. And what I look for in an, in an artist really um, is, 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 is power and vibrance and movement and the way they can use light. I think those flash covers by Yoon really show that a lot. Uh, I know Hal Laren did a, a RoboCop cover for Boom uh, a while ago that was just absolutely amazing where a RoboCop's falling back through glass and he's firing his gun and uh, just really, uh, you know, it's, it's almost, again, going back, it, it just, it hits you when you see it. You're like, wow. I don't like covers that are static, right? I like the cover to be, uh, th this is comic books, man, right? Like, we, we, we're, we're all basically little kids in big boys' bodies at this point, and, big, and, and little girls in big girls' bodies. So this is comic books, man. I want to see explosions. I want to see light. I want to see movement. I want to see action. Uh, and I think guys like Laren and Yoon and Ryan Brown, th those are guys to, to look for for that type of stuff, too. Yeah, it reminds me, like, you're not going to go see a movie if the movie poster looks dull, right? <laughs> if exactly. it's trying to sell you on, on what you're going to be, uh, what content you're going to be taking in. So I, I get your point on what you're saying about the cover art. But right. also, I'm dying to hear what your answer to this is, Kevin. Um, well, for – okay, so for me, uh, I've got a couple names that are – that are up and coming artists, I would say in the comic book world, let me, let me state that. And then I've got a couple of names that have been around for a while, but I think they're due to kind of get back into, into the variants and comic books. So that's all right. Um, so one artist that I really like that's kind of new to comics is Jay Ferguson. He's done uh, a few Vampirella covers for us. He's a very, he does a very realistic uh, painting with airbrushes. Um, and he did a GI Joe cover for us you know, of a skull oh, nice. and with the COVID, you know, so there's, so I really like his art. It's very realistic. Um, he's very detailed and he's very easy to work with. Um, so I would say he's somebody to look for. Um, <clears throat> Alan Kwa is somebody that I'm working with and he's a really good artist, very good ink, um, very, very pleasant to work with. Um, and he, you know, I would really, I've been asking Marvel to allow him to do a Venom cover, so I'm, I'm trying my best. Um, so I really like Alan's work, and we're, we're working on a, a Bloodshot cover soon, so hopefully that'll come out in the fall. Um, and so a couple names that I would throw out there that have been around for a while, uh, Ken Lashley. I think that it, he, it's time to kind of get him 
doing some variant covers. Now, obviously, he's been in the comic book world for a while. I'm not, you know, he's not a new artist, but I haven't seen uh, much much of his work in a while. Um, so I, I would really like to use him for a cover. Um, and then another artist who's been around a long time, long, long time, uh, Olivia de Bardinas. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her last name correctly. So she's she's done a lot of pinup work for Playboy. She's done stuff for um, paintings, <laughs> not modeling, paintings. Um, and uh, sideshow collectibles, uh, prints. Um, she, she did a few comic book covers like in the early 90s. So she hasn't done a comic book cover since since the early 90s. And so she's working on uh, some Vampirella covers for us and also a Harley Quinn cover with DC. So but all the publishers that I've talked to about using her are extremely excited because she's a very famous artist. If you go look on her Instagram, she's got 128,000 followers. Um, and her reach is, is, is really far and wide and she's just been doing this for a long time. So to see her get to do some superhero stuff it, it is really fortunate. And she does everything by hand. There's no digital stuff going on there. And some of it she even paints on wood. So it's, it's pretty cool. I'm very fortunate to be working with her. Um, I, I think I'm most excited about her, but again, she's been, she's been an artist for longer than I've been alive. So. So yeah, those would be some names that I would I would give. I like that, especially the out of left field kind of entry, because that's that's kind of that secret sauce that you kind of have to have when you're you you kind of looking towards the future. Because we've seen this before, where an artist gets big working with a retailer on a you know exclusive variant program, and the next thing you know, now Marvel's got that artist doing covers, and they're less available, <laughs> less available. Yeah. They'll never credit where they got that idea from. Yeah. <laughs> that happens a lot. Yeah. Right. So, you know, it's, you guys seem to be the source where these publishers, they're kind of paying attention to where the up and coming artists are, are coming from. It seems to be the best way for artists to make their mark kind of quickly in just the one book in the right time period. Um, it can do a lot. And you mentioned social media. I think social media has a very, very big impact on uh on artists being able to be successful is, you know, we talk about this even with independent comics or, but their ability to sell themselves, I think uh, aids a lot in this whole process. Yep. Definitely. Instagram is really important for sure. So we've talked about some great topics so far. We still got one more to go. And this is going to be a good one because we often hear there's a lot of collectors out there that want to be retailers or even more think that they can design exclusive variants. If you could provide one piece of advice to the next generations of retailers, what would it be? Kevin, we'll start with you on this one. <laughs> Only one? Uh, <laughs> you can provide lessons learned. Uh, okay. So I would say the thing, the biggest thing for me when I was starting out was not having enough capital. So we, we, I didn't have enough money to properly run the business. Um, so it was really a struggle. And you don't know, like you, you put something up for sale and it may not sell well at first, but you know, three months, four months later, it might start picking up and you have to have enough money to operate, to pay that bill and to keep the business going. Um, so I would say before you jump into, you know, being a retailer, just even if you're going to sell regular comics or you're going to sell store variants, you want to make sure that you have enough money to float the business for several for several months while you build up your customer base and you know get your processes and everything down. Uh, if, if I had to pick one thing, that would be that would be a big thing for me to to let people know. John, I know you're getting into this, but you've been around. You, I mean, I'm sure the the alerts and the, the the light bulbs are going off as as you're making your way into this journey. Um, is there anything that stuck out to you so far as as you start to progress through this? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot a lot of different things, Brian. Um, Kevin made a great point about capital uh, about capital. If you don't have, you know, the ability to cover your expenses, um, you're not going to be in business very long. Um, I'm going to go in a slightly different direction. Um, I'm going to say hustle, and my uh, my wife's going to be thrilled with this. But my inner I have to let my inner Gary Vaynerchuk loose a little bit right here 
um, you got to grind it out and you got to hustle, right? There's a lot of people that have dreams and aspirations. And like I said before, comics to me is all about joy and excitement and emotion. And uh, sometimes I think that that carries people um, into thinking that they can do things that maybe they can't do. Um, you got to be willing to work and grind it out. You got to be willing to, you know, um, like, like I've done in the past, work a nine to five, come home and grind it out till 2 a.m. You know what I mean? On your business. You got to be able to put in the work and, and hustle, you know, and you got to be willing to make sacrifices, uh, whether that's time with your wife or your children, uh, four beautiful children. Sometimes I have to sacrifice time with my kids to work on the business. Uh, sometimes we have to put date night on hold, my wife and I, so, so we can work on the business. Um, and I think that if you're, you know, binge watching Netflix and Disney Plus constantly, that those are minutes that are not going towards your business, right? Now, not to say that I never do it could these be R&D. <laughs> What's that, Brian? It could be R&D for you. Yeah. I mean, it's, oh, it could be. I mean, that's a good point. Um, I don't know what you're saying, though. I, I it, agree with what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, every, I mean, we only have so much time, right? So I think triage is very important. You're almost like an emergency room uh, nurse or a doctor or a police officer when you're running your own business. You have to triage and you have to be able to uh, execute, right? On what's most important at that, at that moment right there. And I just think that um, a lot of people dramatically underestimate what it takes to run a successful business and they're not willing to put in the work. Having a successful business is like having six pack abs, right? Everybody wants it. You just got to put the work in in the kitchen and the gym to get that, right? Um, it's attainable. It can happen. Uh, and it all comes down to execution and grind and hustle. So I would just say hustle, that one word. I said a lot of words to say one word. <laughs> well, you guys are definitely the experts at this topic, but I do want to add a little bit in the limited experience that Brian and I have had um, developing some projects as a part of the aforementioned comicbookinvest.com. Some things that kind of I learned was especially important when you're working it with a group. Kevin, you mentioned shared retailer uh, variants. I know, John, you were working on the same sort of thing. Um, when you're working with a group is to make sure that everybody's really on board with the project. We worked on some projects where there's always going to be compromise, right? You may compromise an art on the artist, you know, you may compromise on even which book, but you just can't compromise on certain strategic things. Like what, what are we looking for when we're making a book? And more importantly, the integrity things that come along with this business, because some of the backlash that I think that the retailer exclusive kind of industry is dealing with is really old problems from an old generation that played a lot of games with print run and did a lot of things that now, aren't as prevalent per se in the market, but you start to see things that we've talked about on the channel, about things like artificial print runs and people who want to do things like destroy 75% of a print run to try to make a book seem at a certain scarcity or rarity. Um, and then, you know, those were things that like, you know, if you and your partners aren't jiving on, uh, it, it's going to cause contention. And that was some things like we went through, we experienced, and then working on projects, Kevin mentioned it before. I, I I, when John came to us, when he was starting his and he asked advice, I, this, this is the biggest thing I said is it is hard enough to sell a cover of a book, a variant cover of a book. If you're trying to sell the book and the variant cover, you're doing too much. So people have to already be interested in that book. It has to already be a book that's desirable. Um, so I loved when Kevin kind of touched on that earlier because that was definitely something that, that we kind of went through where, you're trying to hit people from too many fields and that's just asking marketing to do things that they just can't, can't, can't possibly come up with. So we've talked about some great topics, but we also want to take some time now, which we didn't let you guys do in the intro because we were saving it for right now. We want you to know a little bit more about John and Kevin. So we're going to give them the mic and let them tell you what they got working on, what's coming up for them and where you can find them on social media. John, we're going to start with you this time. All right. Um, if, yeah, if I could, if it's all right with you, Brian and Jack, if I could just, uh, just talk about uh, the 616 for a minute um, and then kind of like what we're about and where we're going. Does that sound good? I'm sure our viewers are excited to know because they're probably all going, who's 616? But this guy. we're sure to find out soon. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. Um, so yeah, so the 616 uh, basically started back when I was nine years old. This isn't going to be like a 40 year long story, right? I'm just saying, 
My dad got me into comics when I was nine. He drove me down to the 7-Eleven. We went in and he introduced me to something called the spinner rack. And uh, I was transported immediately into a whole different world, fell in love with comics immediately. Uh, I spent hours and hours of my childhood standing in front of that spinner rack and I would be incredibly frustrated when I would get to the 7-Eleven and someone had gotten to the rack before me and they did the cardinal sin at the spinner rack where they would pull down the books in front to see what was behind it. So if someone got to the Amazing Spider-Man before I got to it, after the, the store owner put it on the rack, I was devastated. So then I started asking the, the store owner if I, could, if I could know what time he would put them on the rack so I could be the first one there. So anyway, that joy and excitement and obsession with comic books lasted from when I was about nine and about 1982 all the way through college. And then like a lot of people, I fell off, right? Years later, my brother, I meet him out for lunch. He brings a Batman comic. He puts it on the table. I said, what, do you, what the hell is that? He said, that's for you. I said, what am I going to do with a comic book? He said, oh, you're the one that got me into comic books. I never stopped reading, right? So I said, okay. So I, I took the comic book home. I read it three times that night and I was transported. All the joy that I had when I was a kid, all the excitement, the feel of the book in your hands, the artwork, the story. I was absolutely enraptured. I was all over again, fell in love with comics. And that's kind of where the 616 started. Like uh, anybody can sell comics, right? There's 50 million people on eBay selling comics right now. There's a, a whole bunch of people that do stuff like uh, Kevin Fields and I do to varying degrees. Uh, anybody can start an LLC. But the 616 Comics is about more than just comics, right? We're about participating in the joy and the excitement and the experience of getting that special book in great condition at a great price, like Kevin said earlier, with excellent customer service, right? You gotta treat the comics and the customer the way you would want your own comics and your own cust and you, you would wanna be treated as a customer of someone else. So the goal of the 616 Comics is to just deliver that same joy and excitement that I felt as a nine-year-old boy standing in front of that spinner rack for hours and hours on end while people were going in and out behind me in the 7-Eleven that's what we're really all about. I just want everyone to know that. And then transitioning from that, uh, we have a really cool, uh, I'm, the 616 is part of the Comics Elite uh, group. So we have a really cool Ryan Brown cover. I mentioned Ryan Brown earlier, phenomenal artist. Uh, Dark Knight's Death Metal number one uh, is gonna be out in a few weeks and uh, we're just super excited. We have a cover A, cover B, uh, and also the set. So that's available at the 616comics.com uh, where you could search the 616comics on Facebook and Instagram is the.616comics. Yeah, and we'll put links in the description of all your social media as well so people can find you. Thank Kevin, you. I'm sure you got like 30 irons in the fire. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was, just, I was just trying to think about what I should discuss. We have the Ray cover coming from Peach, and the art's been available. Um, we have another Peach cover coming uh, for Thor. So it's a homage to, and I like homage covers. Um, and so this is a homage to the Mighty Thor 337. Um, so that's coming. Uh, and what else is a kind of a cool thing? So my wife and I are opening up a, a, a brick and mortar store. Um, so that's been on my mind quite a bit because um, we, so we take possession July 1st. And so we're starting to get hot and heavy into to designing the store. And I've got to work on a sign design and stuff. So that's pretty big news for us. Um, we're going to try to structure it a little bit differently. So, um, you know, I've been to a few comic book stores in my day, um, and we we don't want to have a typical comic book store, so we're going to basically kind of have it so you're you know you it's a it's basically a pickup. So you you buy the comics on our website, the regular comic store variants, and you come and you pick them up. We'll text you when your order's ready. Um, we'll have a few books on the wall, not many, um, but we we don't want to have long boxes everywhere. Um, because one, one, this kind of goes back to one of the other questions. Um, comic book stores typically end up with a lot of back stock. <laughs> um, and you've got folks who, who don't pay for their pull lists. 
you know, I'm sure you guys have seen that on oh, social yeah. media. You know, this could have paid, this stack of books could have paid my rent. <laughs> um, but, you know, 99% of the people that we sell to, they have a Netflix subscription. They have a Amazon Prime subscription. So they're used to paying every month for something. And But for some reason in the comic book world, we we, you know, let you order whatever you want and hope that you come and pay for it. <laughs> I've been saying that. I've been saying that. So, that's, that's such a um, so we're, we're not going to, cause you, you can't, you, it's really hard to turn a profit doing that. Cause it's like on a, you know, a hope and a prayer. Like I hope right. somebody <laughs> get their books this week. I can't, we can't do that. Um, so, you know, you will come to our store and you'll, you'll go online and order your comics two months in advance and you'll pay at the end of that previews co- catalog at the end of that month, we're going to hit your credit card. So I don't know, you know, it's a, it's a risk. It's a very different model for comic books, but we're going to give it a shot. Um, And another thing that a lot of people say, and and I'm not saying this is good or bad, but that a lot of folks will come into a comic book store and they don't want to actually buy anything. They just want to hang out. Um, We're going to encourage people to hang out on our, in our Facebook group um, so that they can have a community there um, as opposed to in the in the shop, you know, especially now with the the virus, the COVID virus and stuff, I think that uh, you know states and local officials are really encouraging folks to get in and out of retail stores quickly, <laughs> and to keep that distancing. So we're we're going to kind of do that. So we don't want long boxes everywhere. We want to have a, just a few wall books, um, you know. So if if my subscribers are ordering ten copies of Batman, I may order twelve, and there will be only two copies on the shelf. And when those two sell. There's an empty spot. Um, I think some retailers are afraid to have an empty space on the shelf. I, I'm not because that means I sold what I ordered and I can move on. You know, and we see a lot of folks posting, oh, my, my LCS went out of business. Uh, you know, LCS is our endangered species. Well, I mean, I think a lot of it is to do with the overordering of merchandise that they have to pay for. Um, so you see, uh, as a side note, you know, a lot of people, it's the 90s. There's going to be a crash. <laughs> you see that all the time, right? Well, the the, stru- the comic book industry is structured very differently. Um, the, the retailers take the risk. So they order, they pay, they get the merchandise. And if it doesn't sell, they're stuck with it. The publishers got their money in most cases. In most instances, Diamond Comics has got their money in most instances. Now, some, some retailers will go bust and they won't pay their bill, but it's the minority of, of, of those stores. So it's a very different environment. You're not going to see an implosion like you did in the nineties because the risk has been pushed to the retailers. So it's, it's basically printing to order now. Um, so we're going to order your comics. You'll come pick them up. And if you want to hang out, you're welcome to do that in our Facebook group. Um, and you know, that's kind of our plan. We'll see if it works. I could be on here six months from now saying that was a terrible idea, <laughs> but I'm willing to definitely admit when I'm wrong um, and to learn from my mistakes, but we're going to give this a shot and see if it's something that can work okay for us. Um, so that's my, that's my pitch, my plug. Well, what I would love to do if you would have me is you're just a, a short few hour drive away from me. I would love to come uh, and check out the store for like the grand opening and, and sure. uh, you know, show the community this unique as a retailer by trade. I'm all about these unique and innovative retail spaces because I, I wholeheartedly agree with what you're saying to push this business forward. We have to make these sort of innovative decisions and changes to the business. So um, I would love to bring the Simplements Comics cameras uh, up to uh, check you out up in the Apex area and uh, uh, bring the viewers kind of a little guided tour of the brand new Frankie's operation when it's up and running. Well, you'd be absolutely welcome. We'll have, when we do the official opening, you know, we'll have some artists join us. Um, I'm hoping Clayton Crane will come. Uh, so, so we'll definitely have some artists and uh, we'll, we'll have a good time. We always do. But uh, it's going to be a few months. We need to get things up and running and we can't make any changes to the space until we take possession in July. Mm-hmm. So it's going to take a couple months to get us where we want to be. But that's the, that's the goal. So this is really exciting for us. That's awesome. <clears throat> Kevin, did you want to plug your Facebook group? Sure. So uh, we, we have a Facebook group attached to Frankie's Comics. 
And um, it's, it's basically a public group. There's no, you know, you have to answer a few questions to, to get in the group because at one point somebody went into the group and tried to sell a lawnmower. <laughs> so we, you, you, I mean, seriously, <laughs> um, it was red. I mean, it, this is for real. Like, so, <laughs> Um, we, you know, I just have some basic questions, you know, just to see if you know anything about comics, you know, so, um, that's it really. And that's the only requirement is that you answer three questions, very easy, very easy questions. Um, and, and some people put, you know, like so there's some folks who, who don't know anything about getting comics graded. So one of the questions is who's the better grading company, CBCS or CGC? There's no right answer to that. It's just to see if you have any idea what that is. Um, you know, some people, there are some folks who say, I don't have never gotten anything graded. Well, that's an acceptable answer. At least you answered the question. So, um, and the only other rule really is just to be nice. I mean, so it's, it's open to everybody to come. And we do like the, the Yoda cover was only sold. My allocation was only sold to the Facebook group. And um, you guys will get it for your bolo boxes. Um, but, and then the Ray cover by Peach is only going to be sold to group members. So we do stuff that's special for the group. And here's the other thing that the group members get, uh, group members in the United States get free shipping on any order. Huge. So it's pretty so, easy to join and everybody's pretty nice. So. so again, Brian and I are members of this group. This group is absolutely sensational it's if, if you're at all a fan of the things that frankie's comics do you need to be in the group to get the cover our images early to know what's going on what's the schedule of releases as well as those code words for those variants as you mentioned available exclusively to the group but i also like that little nugget you put in there so i've got to use a little promo for that be on the lookout for those bolo boxes because as you mentioned we're going to have some of those peach moco variants Hitting you guys out there, you Patreon subscribers, who we appreciate keeping this channel running. Absolutely, yep. And you guys are going to get a, a variant that I haven't sold at all anywhere. Ooh. So that's <laughs> we're not. I've decided not to sell it right now on our website. So you guys are really? going to get that. Yeah, that's awesome. Yep. So I think that was an amazing discussion on retailer exclusive variants, the process, and it's especially coming from the minds of two people who are creating these exclusives as we speak. I will say to the Simpleman's Comics community, we have told you guys that there will be some Simpleman's Comics exclusive variants coming down the pike uh, at some point. I will say stay tuned. That is absolutely uh, in the works. Uh, several projects um, are being developed right now. So you know, we told you that we had something coming with the top 10 list. We delivered the book. Trust me when I tell you we've got some stuff coming. But also I want to send a, a special shout out um, and some um, thoughts and support to, we mentioned them earlier in the uh, episode, but uh, Golden Apple Comics out in California um, who had their storefront um, affected by some of the, the looters and protesters. Uh, the country's in pain right now, and a lot of people are kind of going through it. It's unfortunate to see uh, businesses like theirs impacted by it. So I want to make sure we send them a shout out and let them know that we support them and love them, because um, that's unfortunate to see happen within our community. Yeah, and I want to take this time also to thank one, John, thank you for coming on. I also want to take this time right now. You might have seen the announcement on Instagram and Facebook between both of our pages, but we, John's not only a retailer, but he is now a channel partner as well. We have yeah. Frankie's a sponsor. We have John as a channel partner. So we're going to be doing a lot of things together with him as well. You kind of heard Jack mention something, so pay attention to that. But I also want to take this time to let Kevin know, thank you so much for all you do for Superman's Comics and the community. Yes. I think you're part of the huge process of, of the growth that we've had on this channel. We like to talk about integrity and community on here. So that's exactly why we had you on to discuss these topics. Let our viewers know the man, the wizard behind the curtain, so to say, um, <laughs> say Frankie's comics kind of reminds me a lot of people are like, I think your name is Frankie's. It's kind of like that hoodie in the bullfish <laughs> type thing, I guess. But uh, um, even, yeah. even between, even between me and Brian, we'll be going in a conversation and we'll call you Frankie and have to stop you. Like Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people a lot of people do that frankie was our dog our pup That's so. <laughs> my well, before we go my i wanted to share this uh if i can get it in the <laughs> it <went> invisible. <laughs> ah! 
<laughs> okay, wait, hold on here. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta. Uh, it green screen you. Is get like rid a... of my. Yeah, let's see, none. All right. Okay, so Peach was kind enough to do a commission for my wife of a Frankie our pug. She's passed away, but this is the oh. commission. Oh wow, that that's Peach cool. did for awesome. us. So that's yeah, that's incredible. So that's Frankie. So. That is Thanks, Peach guys. Uncle Frankie. That's awesome. <laughs> Again, we will put yep. links to all both of their socials in the description. Uh, in the meantime, make sure you check out the 616comics.com as well as frankiescomics.com. The URLs are up on the screen as well. But like he said, you can support us, support the channel, get those bolo boxes at patreon.com forward slash simplemans comics. Link is out in the description. But again, thank you, John. Thank you, Kevin. This has been Simple Man's Comics. And oh. We'll see you guys in the next video.